So I have the privilege of presenting a technology that was developed by Randy Lind and Lonnie Love. And this is uh, wearable exoskeleton technology. So the, the point I was hoping to make uh, with this talk is that those of us who just finished uh, taking our kids to see the Iron Man movie not too long ago, it's upon us. So uh, there's been interest literally over the last century in coming up with useful exoskeleton technologies, and we're this close to having something that will really make a difference. So I, you know, you've got to look at a little bit of history. Uh, it turns out the notion of having a performance-enhancing exoskeleton is not new. And it also turns out that the notion of having a performance-enhancing exoskeleton almost always has a military driver. And in this instance, it was the Russian military that thought what they needed to do was get some springs and put them on the legs of their soldiers to make them able to run faster and jump higher. Uh, it looks promising. In fact, if you've been to Disney World, you've seen something that looks a lot like this. Uh, but it turns out in the 1890s, there's no evidence that the device was ever actually fabricated or tested. But this is the first exoskeleton, uh, Nicholas Yagen. About 70 years later, exoskeletons entered popular consciousness again. This is the very first Iron Man. And I'm convinced that Iron Man, the comic book, drove the nation's research agenda. And I have in particular suspicions about DARPA because they funded the General Electric Hardy Man, not three years later. And Hardy Man was an effort uh, to create an exoskeleton that would allow a normal person to lift 1,500 pounds with ease uh, and uh, with, without having fatigue. And it's very cool, and it has great pictures. It turns out, though, when they turned it on, it went into violent oscillations, and so they didn't think that was the best thing to put their people in. So while they have lots of really nice pictures, uh, it, it never actually was deployed with a human being. Uh, in 1987, so we've talked military applications so far. In 1987, Monty Reed, who was a retired Army angel, uh, ranger who had broken his back, uh, took on the other dominant reason for doing an exoskeleton, and that's medical. And uh, he developed this as a therapeutic tool uh, and, and also as an enabler for, for just mobility for people who've been injured. And uh, in 2003, he wore a version of this in a 5K foot race. So that's the other half of the exoskeleton technology. Uh, the Oak Ridge National Lab story, though, begins in 2001. And DARPA began a military exoskeleton program uh, and engaged three contractors, a company called Sarcos Research Corporation, the University of California at Berkeley, and the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And they were given the opportunity to develop technologies related to exoskeleton, again, primarily for military applications. And you can see this is what uh, uh, the current implementation looks like. Uh, so Randy and Lonnie, when taking this on, as I understand it, took a close look at hydraulic systems. Uh, most of the, uh, the, the most efficient way to uh, convert uh, mechanical motion from electric impulses via a, a hydraulic system. And uh, they have developed several inventions that make it possible to more efficiently transfer energy and also to, uh, to do it with a, with a smaller form factor. So one of their inventions uh, is the uh, Involute, Involute? Involute, thank you, uh, shape cam. And these are two um, basically linear to rotational motion devices. So you see you have uh, two pistons here. These would be hydraulic pistons. Uh, one would push and cause it to rotate in this direction. Then the other would push and cause it to rotate in the other direction. And then here you have uh, one with a, different, uh, with a different throw, but the same, same notion. Why would you do that? Well, to, and this, this was much slower on my computer, but it's something to kind of wake us up. Uh, it turns out that the traditional way to convert linear motion to uh, rotational motion, just kind of what you would see on a, on a freight train, uh, and that is the, uh, uh, the slider crankshaft. So as this, maybe we can pause that. There we go. So as, uh, as this thing strokes back and forth, it causes uh, the, the it drags around the wheel, and so you have a translation from linear to uh, to circular motion. Now the problem is, uh, if you're pushing at the top or the bottom, you have very good torque because you have a nice angle. But if you're pushing in line with the axis, you have very poor torque. So in fact, the uh, the torque varies kind of strongly as a function of position. And uh, if it doesn't have a little bit of momentum, you can find yourself stuck in these positions where you go to zero torque. The cam, on the other hand, uh, has a 
precisely calculated surface so that regardless of where you are in your rotation, you have uniform torque. So the first advantage of this design is that it provides you with uniform torque over the entire range of motion. And you guys have demonstrated this up to 179 degrees, I think. So um, the second thing, and here we have the same. This was really cool when it wasn't going this fast. Uh, you'll notice that they use a piston that goes back and forth, and so you have to change the direction. If there's any machining slop at all, then you're going to have a little bit of uh, intrinsic backlash that's built in that change of direction. Because this has two antagonistic pistons, one pushes to have you rotate in one direction, the other one is engaged and is ready to push you and you go in the other direction, then you lose that backlash, and it gives you the ability to have much smoother, much uh, finer control over the motion. So that's the first, first class of, uh, of inventions. Uh, the second are systems to allow you to have very miniature uh, hydraulic uh, devices. The, uh, the best name for what they're doing is the mesofluidic controlled robotic or prosthetic finger. And then they also have a digital valve that enables this prosthetic finger. And uh, it's a small hydraulic system for high-strength miniature robotic systems. It's notionally the same size as a human finger, but it's able to pick up 50 pounds. Uh, it has extremely accurate control. And the digital control of fluid is what you could call the secret sauce. And here the notion is uh, if you're going to have uh, high strength, uh, you need to be able to have high pressure. Uh, but typically, high pressure is associated with high fluid flow, so you tend to have things moving. But if you want to be miniature, you don't want to operate in the high fluid flow space, so you need to have the ability to maintain high pressure with have, without having a lot of flow. And what they devised is a set of valves that are digital valves that allow you to have high pressure and just push a drop out and then pause and then push out another drop and then pause. And so those of us that have electrical engineering backgrounds, this is pulse width modulation. So you can basically maintain that high pressure, but do it in little bursts, and that way the average flow becomes the, uh, the control flow and allows you to have high strength while at the same time having very fine structures and, and having um, uh, fine control of it. So this is kind of the range of fluidics, and you can see we have flow on this axis, and it's on a logarithmic scale, and you have pressure on this action. Uh, and if you're looking down at things that are micro-machined on a, on a, on a, like a MEMS circuit, then you're way down in this corner. Commercial valves tend to be here, and these guys have achieved having the high pressure that you want, but operating down in a very low flow regime. So that's, that's the basic goodness of this. Now, one other thing happens. So what they have is um, a couple of uh, new hydraulic capabilities uh, that have nice tight form factors. And then they happen to also be working in one of the world's premier additive manufacturing facilities. And so uh, these things tend to have very complex shapes. But now with additive manufacturing, they have the ability to draw basically anything they want and create the shapes that they need to make this work. Uh, and one of the cool examples, if you get a chance to go out on YouTube and look up the, uh, uh, the Army Pet Man, uh, the arm that you'll see in that video is theirs. And it has, again, very complex uh, shape and form factor. And they have the ability to uh, embed a number of different systems or sensors into the space. So here's uh, another uh, funded activity that, that's related to this. This is an o o ONR, Op uh, Office of Naval Research uh, robot. Uh, one of the cool things about additive manufacturing is you have the ability to decide if you put air pockets in. So this is a uh, neutral buoyancy device. You can see there's one of their rotational cams in action. I think you have seven different joints on this one. Is that right? So this gives you the ability to have, again, complex and finely controlled manipulation uh, with the hydraulic system. So... What's the technology opportunity? Well, first, uh, it's pretty far down the road, particularly for a national lab. It's very far down the road. Uh, it has been demonstrated in prototype systems at about, set about TRL-6. Uh, the next step would be to deploy it in uh, field deployable systems. We're not aware of any showstoppers. The only caveat I've heard is that, uh, in particular in the case of the CAM, it is a finely machined surface, so it's not something that you just stamp out. Uh, we have no active projects. Uh, we have active projects in place to continue the technology development, so we think there's every reason that this will mature. Uh, let's talk about the leadership. Uh, the two technology features that we talk about are the joint and the valve. Uh, the joint, again, provides a compact form factor with uniform torque over its range of motion. Uh, the verified performance has been over 170 degrees. has been found to be 90% efficient, uh, and it gives you an anthrop 
anthropomorphic configuration, and they've implemented it with seven degrees of freedom. Uh, the valve design, again, provides fine control with the miniature form factor. Uh, the prototype was able to lift 50 pounds. It has 10 times the power density of a similarly sized motion, so this is why you go with hydraulics rather than with uh, electric motors. It has a small size that allows for integrated design. Uh, there's no tear loss. It's energy efficient. Uh, and one nice feature is that it doesn't take energy to hold it in position. It's reliable and inexpensive and doesn't have many moving parts. Uh, what are the applications, or who would be your target customers, and what's the current practice? Uh, well, uh, exoskeleton for human performance augmentation was the initial uh, space that was, uh, was conceived, and that would be a wearable device to augment human strength and speed. Uh, you would expect the military, the medical community, and maybe the industrial community to have interest of that. And these are in development. Uh, typically, they have complex electrical and hydraulic systems. You could also envision robotic prosthetic devices. Uh, these will be functional prosthetic lens. Uh, you can see there's an increasing need for that. Uh, the target customer, of course, would be somebody who's uh, an amputee. And these today range from simple mechanical devices to complex electrical and hydraulic systems. Uh, you could also envision remotely controlled robotics. Uh, the pet band would be an example of that. Uh, you could put these in an underwater or a hostile environment. Again, this would be military and industrial. And today you see complex electrical systems and hydraulic systems. And for fun, you could think about autonomous robots, think Star Wars or the Jetsons. Uh, this would potentially have initially a military application and, uh, or a novelty. And then as time goes on, it could be useful. And today it's a laboratory novelty. So what's the competition look like? Well, there actually are about five companies that are making noise in the exoskeleton skeleton space. You recognize this name. Raytheon was one of the original uh, DARPA-funded companies. And they have uh, put in place a, an exoskeleton with uh, military applications in mind. Uh, this is a Japanese company, Cyberdyne, and they have the Human Assistive Limb Exoskeleton, or HAL. Uh, you have the Exo, which this is a, uh, a follow-on. I believe it's the same company as the uh, uh, as a spin out of Berkeley that was one of the early contractors. Uh, and they have the Human Universal Load Carrier, HOLK. You've got to have a good acronym. Uh, Honda has the Experimental Walking Assisted Device. This is for medical applications. And Argo has the Rewalk Device. And it's, it's important to note that... Uh, while these are competitors in terms of living in the space where Oak Ridge Technologies works, uh, they're more likely really potential customers because this is an enabling set of technologies that these guys have developed uh, that could go to any one of these customers. So uh, Raytheon, for example, today uses traditional hydraulics. Uh, the, the new hydraulics could be advantageous. Similarly, uh, the Cyberdyne uh, HAL uses traditional electronics. Now, what's cool about this is it has sensors that can actually track when you begin to move, and then it gives you the motion assist in, in, that, uh, in that direction. Uh, the Hulk is the same idea, traditional hydraulics. Uh, the experimental walking device from Honda uh, uses electric motors rather than hydraulics. They also have sensors that respond to muscle motion. And then Rewalk has an electric motor technology. So uh, I would offer that uh, these are companies that would be interested in perhaps engaging with somebody that's able to manufacture uh, these hydraulic systems. Market opportunity, well, I've seen one uh, prospectus by a startup that wants to go into the medical space, and they say that uh, just the lower extremity exoskeleton market is expected to be about a billion dollars annually. Uh, if you look at global medical robotic systems, and that, of course, includes remote surgery suites, uh, that's a $13.6 billion market by 2018. Uh, and then the industrial exoskeleton market has been estimated by some to exceed $10 billion. We're talking about a part of that, but it's big enough to be interesting. And if you are interested in more information, uh, Jennifer Caldwell is responsible for this portfolio, and I'd be happy to take questions. Yes, sir. Well, there's a number of uh, what you call green hydraulic fluids out there that are, you know, biocompatible, that, that sort of thing. So that's really not an important issue, I don't think. Okay. Yes, sir. The weight of this assembly right here, how would that, uh, how would that compare to... Uh, the goal, of course, is to make one that's uh, similar weight to a, to a human limb, and, and, and we can pretty much reach that. 
um, with this technology. What you're looking at there is one that was uh, printed using a titanium printer, 3D printer, and so we're able to make very, very thin walls <clears throat> and eliminate any extraneous weight. So um, right now, you saw the robot that was operating in the underwater, for example. That robot was, uh, is on the order of about 20 pounds or so for the, for the whole arm itself. So you can see that's um, you know, getting in the ballpark of a human arm weight. Yes, sir. Well, um, <clears throat> one of the things that we were really going after with this program was a way to make really inexpensive hydraulic valves. You know, you can go out on the market right now and purchase a servo valve um, that will uh, control the flow. Uh, adequately, but each valve will cost about $5,000, okay? So what we were looking at is valves that could be made for much, much less because on, a, on a, a system like this, you might have hundreds of valves potentially if you have, for example, if you have finger motion even in that. So we were looking at, at constructing valves that were inexpensive to make, and this, the digital valve, uh, for example, has relatively low tolerances inside. So by using this pulse width modulation technique, we're able to regulate flow with uh, uh, components that are, are, are relatively easy to make as compared to, say, typical servo valves. I misunderstood that I thought it was the valve with micro-machining. The valves are very small, but, but micro-machining means something special, I know, out there in the community. Um, the, these are... These parts would be made normally on, a, on what you call a typical Swiss turning machine, so they're, they're not um, of special tolerance, I wouldn't say. Any more questions? Well, great. Uh, next, it's my privilege to introduce Tom Rogers, who is going to speak to us about a robot for inspecting ventilation stacks.